Okay, hello everyone. This is Dr. Vermilio. I'm at uh, East Carolina University. And this lecture is on auditory disorders and occupational health. All right, so for my bio, uh, I've been an audiologist since uh, 1992. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at ECU in the Department of Communication Disorders and Sciences. I worked in research at a place called the House Ear Institute in Los Angeles, California. I'm the code of a co-developer of a speech recognition and noise test. That's a test that measures a person's ability to understand speech in the presence of background noise. And this test was developed in over 17 languages. Uh, it's been used in research and by the FBI, the Secret Service, and the Los Angeles Police Department and others have used this test also. Prior to audiology, I worked as a professional musician, uh, as a civilian and in the military with the uh, Navy and the Army Reserves. Uh, I visited my alma mater. This is the, used to be called the Armed Forces School of Music. Now the, they call it separate components. Now it's the Naval School of Music uh, in Virginia. So this is me on my visit over there. And you, you know, when I was a, a student way back when I was 18 years old, uh, in our practice rooms, you see this happy drummer over here playing his little heart out. There were no warnings like this about wearing uh, hearing protection. Uh, this didn't exist back then. And I wish it had because uh, playing drums all those years, later I came back at, as a percussion instructor and all I did was listen to happy drummers all day long uh, who were part of the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps music programs. Uh, it really tore up my ears. So I'm not only an audiologist, I'm also a patient. Uh, so this is me back in the day in Australia with the Navy band uh, from the Seventh Fleet. We were stationed in uh, Japan and toured all over the Far East. And then uh, I was on the Constellation in the Persian Gulf and below, right below this deck, I uh, actually did a rock band rehearsal during flight operations. So we were slamming loud rock and roll in an all metal room with a metal deck, metal overhead, uh, metal bulkheads uh, during the, the flight operations. And we were trying to play louder than the sound of the jet aircraft. It was fun, but it was the worst thing we could do to our hearing. Ability. Also, we used to just hang out on, on deck and watch the, the jets take off. Uh, and nobody told us that we should consider wearing hearing protection. It, it just wasn't a thought back then. So an overview of this talk. Uh, we're going to talk about the auditory system, uh, just a quick uh, overview of the anatomy and physiology of the auditory system. Then we're going to get into the description of hearing loss and something called pure tone thresholds, which has been called the gold standard test in audiology. Uh, for hearing ability, we'll talk about a speech recognition and noise disorder. And we're gonna talk about this tension between speech recognition and noise versus pure tone threshold testing. Uh, so there's some interesting things going on in, in the field about that. Uh, we'll talk about a few common disorders of the outer ear, middle ear, cochlea, eighth nerve auditory brainstem pathways, and the central auditory system. Uh, we'll talk about a few case studies, and then we'll talk about intervention strategies used to prevent and control noise-induced hearing loss. So here's an overview of the auditory system. This is, as you probably all know, this is the, the uh, ear. This is called the pinna. This is the ear canal. Sound goes in, is directed inside the uh, ear canal. It vibrates the eardrum, which vibrates the ossicular chain. These are the smallest bones in the human body. And it vibrates, uh, this is the uh, stapes bone. It vibrates in this thing called an oval window. And it moves fluids and the structures that are bathed in these fluids inside uh, this thing called the cochlea. Uh, you know, if you look at a cadaver and you do some dissection, you actually don't see the cochlea. It's all embedded in bone. But if you ground away the bone just before something called the membranous membrane, it would look like this. Coming out of the middle of the cochlea is the uh, auditory branch of the eighth nerve. 
also ca uh, called the uh, acoustic nerve. And this is where sound is transmitted from the sensory organ for hearing on over to the brain stem into the brain. So this is the outer ear, this is the middle ear, this is called the inner ear. And then from the eighth nerve, uh, the, the ner uh, neural tracks go through the, what's called the brain stem. So these are the auditory brain stem pathways. And then it delivers the signal to the auditory cortex. And when the sound gets here, if everything's okay in this chain of events, then that's how we hear. A hearing loss may be due to, to damage or disorder in any of these areas. Okay, so keep that in mind, any of these areas. Noise, for the most part, will attack this area right here, the inner ear and the structures inside the cochlea. This is the inner ear with all the bone ground away. And here we have the cochlea. That's where it has the structures that vibrate in response to sound. And these structures will send a neural signal through the uh, auditory branch of the eighth nerve. In the cochlea, there's something called the basilar membrane. And on the basilar membrane sits uh, some very important structures. And there's something called a tonotopic relationship, tonotopic relationship across the basilar membrane. At the base, at what we call the base of the cochlea, so that's this area right here. And as the cochlea winds around, we get to the apex of the cochlea. So in the base of the cochlea, the high frequencies are processed. And as it winds around, you get lower and lower frequencies. Okay, so the basilar membrane is sensitive to uh, different frequencies in different locations. Here's the cochlea with, with part of it removed. And you, now you will see these uh, compartments inside the cochlea. And when we stand it up, we see these structures, right? This is called the organ of corti, the organ of corti. And this is where the outer hair cells and the inner hair cells are. Uh, there are neurons that are connected to the hair cells and they go into the center of the cochlea. This is called the medialis. And it sends the signal to the auditory nerve. Okay, so here's, the, the structure right here is right here, right? So you see this opening area. This is the scale of vestibuli. This is filled with fluid. This is the scale of media. And this is the scale of tympani. And now we can sort of see some of these hair cells. So you, you have the outer hair cells and the inner hair cells. They're, they're called hair cells because they literally have uh, little hairs on top. So these this is the, th uh, there are three rows of outer hair cells one row of inner hair cells. And as this is the basilar membrane, as this thing rocks up and down in response to the sound, it's actually responding to the fluid motion, which is responding to the motion of the stapes foot plate going in and out of that oval window. So that causes the basilar membrane to vibrate, which causes these hairs on the outer hair cells to move back and forth. That's, that's what sends a, a signal, right? And the, the signal causes these outer hair cells to jump up and down. So they actually shrink, shrink and stretch. When that happens, these uh, stereocilia or hairs on top of the inner hair cells become stimulated. And most of the neurons sending a signal to the brain through the auditory nerve most of the neurons are connected to the inner hair cells, not to the outer hair cells. The outer hair cells are used to help the inner hair cells to perceive the sound or to, re to receive uh, a stimulation in response to sound, especially at, at low to moderate lows. Okay, and we'll get uh, another close look, closer look. Again, here's the cylindrically shaped outer hair cells, the tallest stereocilia, or hair is embedded on the other side of the tectorial membrane, but the hair cells, uh, the inner hair cells, stereocilia are not touching the tectorial membrane. In order for these to move, these outer hair cells again have to jump up and down. It causes a fluid motion over here, which then will cause the, the uh, stereocilia 
to move back and forth. And then that will stimulate the signal going to the eighth nerve uh, fibers. Okay, and so then this represents the outer hair cells, the inner hair cells, outer hair cells, inner hair cells. And this is a cartoon of the configuration from the base of the cochlea to the apex of, of the cochlea. So when we say three rows of outer hair cells, we're literally talking about a row of outer hair cells that spins up the cochlea. And then there's one row of inner hair cells that, that spins up the cochlea. When we see this graph, this is just a two-dimensional two graph. You actually don't get an appreciation for this arrangement. Okay, so we have the tectorial membrane. You have the stereocilia of the outer hair cells and the stereocilia over the inner hair cells. Okay, so imagine here's, here's our outer hair cells, inner hair cells. This is called the organ accordi. And now we're gonna take that tectorial membrane and move it back. And th this is an actual cochlea but the tectorial membrane rolled back and now we're looking down. So we're looking down on, on the top of this uh, and it's hard to see here, but this, this line that goes at the top, that's called the reticular lamina. It's like a blanket, right? And the stereocilia are sticking up through the blanket. So we can't actually see the hair cell structures when we look down at like, like this, but we can see the hairs. And here's the three rows of the outer hair cells, we see the stereocilia sticking out. And over here, it's a little harder to, to visualize, but these are actually the stereocilia of the inner hair cells. Okay, here's another nice view. This, these are the outer hair cells. And then here's the stereocilia of the outer hair cells sticking up. And these structures uh, take a beating in response to very high levels or loud uh, sounds. The inner hair cells, 95% of the afferent neurons, that is the neurons that take the signal from the inner ear or the cochlea to the brain, 95% of the afferents are connected to the inner hair cells. And many afferent neurons uh, called inner radial fibers connect to each inner hair cell. The inner hair cells do not move. The outer hair cells on, a, on the other hand, have only 5% of the afferent neurons. This is why we say most of the signal that we receive in the brain comes from the inner hair cells and not, not from the outer hair cells. Each afferent neuron connects to many outer hair cells, which is the opposite of the inner hair cells. Many afferents connect to each inner hair cell. In this case, with the outer hair cells, each afferent, afferent neuron connects to many outer hair cells. And the outer hair cells stretch and shrink. This is called outer hair cell motility or motion, outer hair cell motility. So for low level sounds, if the outer hair cells do not contract and expand, the inner hair cells will not be stimulated and no signal will be sent to the brain. Okay, so these need to be functioning in order for the, the outer hair cells need to be functioning fully in order for the inner hair cells to respond to low, low level sounds. All right, so uh, occupational risk to the auditory system is primarily in the form of a noise induced hearing loss, which causes damage to the auditory periphery, especially the high frequency portion of the cochlea from about three to 6,000 Hertz. So remember, this uh, cartoon of the basilar membrane. So from the, the, the region from 3000 to 6000 Hertz, that's the region that gets damaged in response to sound. And that's you know approximately this area over here in the cochlea. When we talk about frequencies, the higher the number, the higher the frequency. If you're familiar with the piano, the high frequencies are on the right side of the piano the low frequencies are on the left side of the piano. So if you play a sound at middle C, which is about 256 Hertz, middle C is the middle of the piano. This area of the basilar membrane uh, and this area of the cochlea will be responding. Okay, and again, the damage is uh, most significant over the, the outer hair cells. Okay, so this is a real important point. 
Not all hearing losses are due to noise exposure. Some hearing losses may be due to problems in the outer and middle ear. Some hearing losses may be due to the presence of a tumor on the auditory nerve or lesions of the auditory brainstem pathways or even the cortex. So if you, if you have a worker, you have an employee who works in a very noisy factory, shows a hearing loss, you, you have to question, okay, is this solely due to exposure to loud sounds? Or could there be something medical going on, such as the, uh, the presence of a tumor on the auditory nerve? And that would be uh, in this location over here. Okay, so let's talk about the description of hearing loss and pure tone thresholds. Uh, and let's talk about the units of measure that we're, we're gonna use. There's something called a decibel. And uh, for our purposes, consider a decibel a difference in sound pressure levels, a difference in sound pressure levels. So if somebody said this was 10 dB, what they're saying is the difference between this level and that level is 10 dB. Uh, a higher decibel level is uh, consistent with a louder sound. A lower decibel level is consistent with a softer sound, but the decibel values are not equivalent to this concept called loudness. Loudness is a psychological perception. And when we talk about uh, decibels, for example, in sound pressure level, that's actually a measurable sound level. This is not subjective. Loudness is, is subjective, okay? Uh, and then there's dB SPL, which is decibel sound pressure level with an A-weighted filter, and that's abbreviated DBA. Sometimes the A is in parentheses. And uh, this is a filter. This is where a filter is applied to represent the sensitivity of the normal human ear to sound across frequencies. This unit of measure is commonly applied to the measurement of sound levels in the workplace. So for example, uh, we can't detect a sound. Humans, the, the range of human hearing sensitivity is from about 20 Hertz to 20,000 Hertz. So a sound at say five Hertz is not detectable to the human ear. And so if, if a sound at, at, at five Hertz is not detectable and there's a, a lot of energy at five Hertz and we're trying to determine what is, is this environment a safe, uh, at a safe level for, for a human, if you have a lot of energy at five Hertz, we don't care about it because the the normal human auditory system is not sensitive to uh, a five hertz. So we don't care about that. So we're gonna apply a filter to our measurement and just take that information out. And it's not gonna be uh, in the calculation of the level. So we have dB, which is the difference in sound pressure levels, dB SPL, right? And then we have dB SPL where we apply an A-weighted filter to uh, approximate the, the, the human ear's sensitivity and there's something called dB hearing level, and that's used to describe the level of pure tones and speech stimuli uh, presented to a patient or worker during a hearing test, where zero dB HL represents the average threshold from the norms. So if somebody has a threshold at zero dB HL, you can tell them, oh, your, your threshold, the lowest level that you can hear for that frequency is, uh, is, is at the mean for a distribution of the norms. You, you, you're right at average, okay? So the corresponding levels in dB SPL change across frequencies. And that's, that's due to the change in the uh, sensitivity of the human ear to various sounds. So we're more sensitive to sort of mid frequency sounds, less sensitive to very low frequency sounds. So here's a gentleman in the Navy uh, taking a hearing test. Red goes on the right ear, blue goes on the left ear. Here's an audiologist or a technician uh, administering the test. And you see the sailor has a button he's pushing. And uh, so he's indicating each time he hears the beep sound. And probably many of you have already taken this type of test. So by convention, hearing loss is described in terms of pure tone thresholds. Uh, a pure tone threshold represents the lowest 
audible level of tonal stimuli across a range of frequencies. And pure tone thresholds may be related to speech perception in quiet environments. So you can look at somebody's uh, pure tone threshold results and you can make some sort of inference as to how well they'll understand speech in a quiet environment. Normal, uh, or excuse me, pure tone thresholds are presented on a graph called the audiogram, the audiogram. Here's an audiogram. And you see across the x-axis, we have frequency from lower frequencies to higher frequencies. And then uh, across the y-axis, we have dB hearing level, okay, from uh, relatively low level sounds to high level sounds. We could, it, which is analogous to soft sounds and loud sounds, but again, it's not identical to, to the subjective perception of sound. So uh, th this, this is just to give you a handle on these things. Uh, these are the low frequency sounds. These are the high frequency sounds, which are analogous to low pitch sound and high pitch sound. Uh, the, the term high pitch, that's subjective. The term soft and loud, that's, that's all subjective. But these levels and these frequencies can be measured with an instrument and those are objective measures. This thing right here that looks like a banana is called a speech banana where, oh, I'm sorry, 250, about 256 to 62 Hertz is middle C on the piano if you're familiar with the piano. All right, so here's the, the vowel information is more of the low frequency sounds. And we have these things called voiceless fricatives. So you have the S sound, the F sound, and the voiceless TH sound. These sounds are made without the vocal folds vibrating, and they're at a, a very low level. And you know you can't scream an S, right? S sit down. S the S sound is always at a, at a very low level. Okay, so the, this is the speech banana, and the, the usefulness, usefulness of the speech banana is you can visualize this as you look at audiograms and sort of get a handle on which speech sounds will be audible or available to, you, to your worker or patient. Uh, th there's something called a normal pure tone threshold. And the criterion for a normal pure tone threshold varies across the literature. So if you wanna know if somebody has a normal hearing, I'm gonna put it in scare quotes, uh, you have to ask the question, or and answer the question, what is the threshold? What is the lowest level or yeah, for, for uh, a normal threshold? And anything above these values will be considered some form of hearing loss. But as you look at the criterion in the literature, the, these, these values change. Some people will say, well, 25 dB HL is the upper limit of uh, a normal pure tone threshold. And other people will say, no, no, that's wrong. It's 20 dBHL. And somebody else will say, no, no, that's wrong. It's 15 dBHL. So there's, there's actually no consensus on this. Uh, and it's mostly by convention. All right, so pure tone thresholds are used to describe the degree of hearing loss. Here's again, our audiogram with normal pure tone thresholds. And uh, this is taken from uh, Humes et al a book called Noise in Military Service, Implications for Hearing Loss and Tinnitus. And it's a very informative book. You can actually download it free online from this uh, address over here. So this is telling us, according to this chart, this says that a normal pure tone threshold is less than 25 dBHL. Well, let's look at the threshold at 250 Hertz. So this is the lowest frequency tested here. The threshold is at 10 dBHL. Well, 10 is below 25, so that qualifies as a normal pure tone threshold, right? And you look at all these other thresholds, the highest is at, well, it's at 10 dBHL. So according to this chart, all these thresholds are within normal limits. However, some organizations use pure tone average uh, or PTA to describe the degree of hearing loss. Uh, and so let's talk about a few organizations. There's a group called the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, the National Institute for o Occupational Safety and Health, that's called NIOSH, the World Health Organization, the WHO, 
and the American Medical Association, also known as the AMA. And all, all four of these groups use different pure, different frequencies for their pure tone averages. So it, it gets a little confusing, as you can see, when you're talking to somebody about hearing, hearing ability, and if you're talking to somebody that works at OSHA, well, they're thinking about a pure tone average of the frequencies 2000, 3000, and 4000 hertz. So they take the threshold for each of these frequencies, add them together, divide by three, and that gives you the pure tone average. And NIOSH is actually using a four frequency average. Uh, the WHO is also looking at a four frequency average. And the American Medical Association is also looking at a pure, a, a, a four frequency pure tone average, but the frequencies are not identical. So keep this in mind as you engage in conversations about hearing ability. This is a textbook, very typical early noise induced hearing loss. And you see this notch right here. This is right out of the textbooks. And as you see the audiograms for uh, workers who work around very high levels of noise, you can see that uh, the sensitivity is poor in the in this region in this notch region, and you can see the 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 bottom of that notch uh, may appear at three thousand, four thousand, or six thousand hertz. So again, the noise notch on the audiogram uh, low for this individual low level speech may sound muffled. So you think about that speech banana. Remember the voiceless fricatives are right in that area. So we would say for, for low level speech, our patient here is gonna miss some of the voiceless fricatives. So what's the big deal about that? Well, if you've carried on conversations with individuals who are wearing a mask, you've already experienced that. It's, it's like a, a simulated high frequency hearing loss, trying to carry on a conversation when somebody's wearing a mask. So once they wear a mask, they're actually, the mask is actually attenuating or reducing the high frequency energy in speech. And that's that's why the speech can sound muffled with a mask. Well, the uh, high frequency hearing loss due to exposure to high levels of sound or due to other causes will also sound muffled. And it's, it's similar to listening to somebody speak with a mask. Okay, take a look at this. This is called a profound noise induced hearing loss. This is, you know when you see this, remember that aircraft carrier that I showed you that I was on in the Persian Gulf? the guys that worked on the flight line. Now those guys actually had earmuffs when I was in the Navy many years ago. And um, what I would see when I worked in the VA uh, medical center in Long Beach, California, I'd see guys who had hearing losses like this. And, and we're talking about some young guys. We're not talking about guys that have been working in the factory for 40 years. These are like relatively young guys. And some of them will, would tell me that, uh, you know, I'd ask them about their hearing loss and about their exposure to loud sounds. They said they worked on the flight line next to the jet aircraft and uh, their supervisor was trying to communicate with them. And if they, wouldn't under if they couldn't understand them, some of those supervisors would go up to them and they're standing next to the jet aircraft and they yank back on that muff, that ear muff and yell <laughs> into the ear right next to the jet aircraft. So, uh, and, and you would see this over and over again with these, these poor guys that had those experiences. Hopefully they're not doing that now in, in, the, in the modern Navy, but back then th that's how they handled things. So this is a very advanced form of noise induced hearing loss. Remember those structures in the cochlea, the outer hair cells and the inner hair cells? The, mostly it's, you see damage to the outer hair cells, but in a hearing loss like this, there, there's structural damage to both the outer hair cells and the inner hair cells. And notice that it's in the high frequencies, okay? So for speech, if it's a low level sound, remember the low level is over here, high level is over here. For low level speech or even higher level speech, so if somebody's speaking through a PA system, uh, this patient is gonna miss a bunch of the high frequency information. and speech is gonna sound very muffled or muddy. Uh, this is a moderately severe, noise-induced hearing loss. And we know it's a moderately severe loss because we have this handy chart and this tells us the, the degree of the hearing loss in these descriptive terms, excuse me, and also has the, the, uh, the hearing loss range in DBHL. 
So this threshold over here in this noise induced uh, hearing loss, and we could tell that it's noise induced because of this notch, right? That notch, uh, the, the tip of that notch or the, the dip in the notch is at 60 dB HL. We just look over to this chart. Well, 60 dB HL fits in this range. So this is a moderately severe high frequency hearing loss. And it's not just the hearing loss, it's a noise induced hearing loss. And we're inferring that from this uh, notch configuration. Formal audiometric testing is the gold standard for diagnosing hearing loss. And audiometric testing refers to the pure tone threshold testing. This is uh, according to the National Institute on Deafness and Other Communication Disorders. And you can read about that at this link over here. And in the Journal of the American Medical Association in an article by Shagorotsky et al. from 2010, they reported that the NHANES audiometric assessment of hearing loss, which is pure tone thresholds, is the gold standard objective measure and has been shown to be reliable in numerous studies. So the pure tone thresholds, those are called the gold standard for the assessment of hearing. NHANES stands for the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, NHANES. According to the Oxford Dictionary, a gold standard is a thing of superior quality, which serve, serves as a point of reference against which other things of its type may be compared. In a diagnostic accuracy study, a gold standard is also called a reference standard test. It represents the best method for the detection of the presence and absence of a target condition or disorder. So we have uh, hearing conservation programs, also called HCPs. In uh, the philosophy, the premise of an HCP is that pure tone threshold testing is the best way to determine the health of the worker's auditory system. And this is consistent with the guidelines on auditory function from the WHO, the AMA, the National Institute of Health, uh, uh, National Institute on Deafness and Other Communication Disorders, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health called NIOSH, and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. So all these folks are treating pure tone thresholds as the gold standard method to determine the health of the worker's auditory system. Uh, this is from the World Health Organization. Uh, we're gonna talk about the ratings of hearing impairment and the World Health Organization ratings of hearing impairment utilize the pure tone average. We talked about this recently for 500, 1,000, 1, 2,000 and 4,000 Hertz or 0.5, 1.0, 2.0 and 4.0 kilohertz which is 1,000 hertz. Uh, and this is the pure tone average across these four frequencies of the better ear. So they use the better ear pure tone average for these frequencies to infer speech perception in quiet and in noise. So if a person has a pure tone average within normal limits, then they say that there's, there's not gonna be any problems with understanding speech in a quiet environment and also in a noisy environment. So here's the rating scheme. Uh, this is actually an updated scheme. This is the WHO proposed rating scheme. I don't know if it's been accepted yet, but this just came out in a paper in 2018, 2019. So a better ear pure tone average across these frequencies less than 20 dB HL is considered uh, no impairment. The current guidelines are actually using 25 dB as the cut point. So uh, better ear PTA for these frequencies less than 25 dB HL will represent no impairment. And then as the better ear pure tone average increases, that means the, there's uh, the presence of hearing loss and the greater the hearing loss, then these descriptors go up from mild hearing loss to moderate, moderately severe, severe and profound, then you, we see greater hearing difficulties uh, with understanding speech and noise. That's according to, the, to a paper by Dr. Larry Humes out of Indiana, and this is in regards to the World Health Organization. So according to the WHO ratings of hearing impairment, as the better ear pure tone average is elevated, speech perception and noise ability gets worse. So the argument from authority may be used to justify using pure tone threshold measures 
for a hearing conservation program. However, the utilization of hear tone threshold measures as a measure of hearing ability, where hearing in quotes and scare quotes uh, refers to the ability to hear speech in quiet and in noisy environments has been questioned at least since the 1940s. So not everybody's been on board with this idea of using peer tone thresholds as a way to infer the ability to hear, hear speech, uh, especially in noisy environments. So Dennis, Dr. Dennis Butler Fry, he was a psycholinguist, I think it, it, his title was. He was more of a speech guy. He worked uh, with the Royal Air Force during World War II in England. And he said, it is clear that any kind of threshold testing with pure tones, apart from the difficulties attended upon such testing, will not tell the whole story. Fry recommended a functional hearing test would that would measure the ability to recognize speech and background noise in order to simulate conditions approximating to those in which the candidate will have to work. So here's all these uh, candidates to the Royal Air Force that are taking the pure tone threshold test. They're raising their hand, they're pushing the button whenever they hear the tones. And Fry is saying, saying you know what? I don't think this test is telling us the whole story. I think we need to actually test them uh, test their ability to understand speech in the presence of background noise. And Fry, along with uh, Dixon and colleagues in 1946, published a, a paper on the creation of a new uh, speech in noise test called the Royal Air Force Efficiency Test. And they, they reported it was indeed soon apparent in this experimental work that it was difficult to predict from the subject's audiogram whether he was likely to do well or badly in an articulation test in a noise field. The results showed that the scores from a sample of subjects with normal audiograms may scatter just as widely as those from a group of subjects with varying degrees of hearing loss. Well, this is a remarkable comment. So you get a bunch of people with normal pure tone thresholds and you look, <coughs> excuse me, you look at their ability to hear speech and noise and you see the scatter of scores from very poor performance to very good performance and you look at that range of of scores that range of scores is the same as the range of scores for a group of subjects with varying degrees of hearing loss uh they call this an articulation test and our all the articulation test just means a speech perception test Okay, according to the AAOO, and forgive me, I forgot what that acronym stands for. It has something to do with an association for otolaryngologists. Way back in 1959, now this is the roots of these, this concept of using a pure tone average for the detection of, uh, of, of hearing impairment. So according to the AAOO, the ability to hear sentences and repeat them correctly in a quiet environment is taken as satisfactory evidence of correct hearing for everyday speech. Because of present limitations of speech audiometry, the hearing level for speech should be estimated from measurements with a pure tone audiometer. So here, here it is. So the idea is that you know, we need to make sure that these individuals, these, these employees, these patients can understand everyday speech in everyday life. And, but because of the present limitations of speech audiometry, they're saying because there's some problems with speech testing back in, in, in the late fifties, they said the hearing level for speech should be estimated or inferred from measurements with a pure tone audiometry. For this purpose, the Subcommittee on Noise recommends the simple average of hearing levels at three frequencies, 500, 1000, and 2000 hertz. So this group, the AAOO, used a pure tone average for three frequencies, 500, 1000, and 2000 hertz. So here's two important points to note. Uh, one, the chief concern about hearing was the ability to hear everyday speech. And two, an assumption had been made about the relationship between pure tone average for 500, 1000 and 2000 Hertz and the ability to perceive everyday speech. Now, according to the AAOACO, 
they stated that the AAOO uh, 1959 guidelines do not necessarily apply to the hearing of speech in noisy environments. So way back in 1979, they were saying, you know, these guidelines seem a little suspicious. Uh, it doesn't necessarily apply to a person's ability to hear speech and noise. But of course, this is something that the Royal Air Force uh, brought up in the mid 1940s. And look at this is uh, in 1979. So quiet was chosen originally for that purpose because it was easier to agree on its definition than on that of a standard noise environment that would simulate an everyday listening situation. So they're saying speech perception and quiet was cho chosen uh, because of speech perception and noise tests, uh, you know, they, they couldn't agree on what noise to use, et cetera, et cetera. So however, when the noise level begins to approach the level of the speech signals, as occurs in, uh, this should say many, everyday listening situations, the 1959 guidelines no longer provide an accurate measure of handicap. Okay, the AAOACO further states, the committee feels that the basis for the calculation of hearing handicap should be altered to reflect a more realistic degree of understanding of speech, not only in quiet, but also in the presence of some noise. And according to NIOSH 1998, the most common protection goal is the preservation of hearing for speech discrimination. Using this protection goal, employed the term hearing impairment to define its criteria for maximum acceptable hearing loss. And OSHA later used the slightly modified term material hearing impairment to define the same criteria. In this context, a worker has considered, was considered to have a material hearing impairment when his or her average hearing threshold levels or HTLs for both ears exceeded 25 dB at the audiometric frequencies of 1,000, 2,000, and 3,000 hertz, uh, denoted here as the one, two, three kilohertz definition. Uh, the assumption is that a pure tone average for 1,000, 2,000, and 3,000 hertz is correlated to the ability to perceive speech and that a pure tone average for these frequencies less than 25 dBHL indicates normal hearing for speech perception. Keep in mind that different organizations use different pure tone averages. So one person might have a pure, might have a, a normal hearing with one organization, but an, under a different organization's guidelines, they might have a hearing loss. The protection goal incorporated in the definitions of material hearing impairment uh, has been to preserve hearing for speech discrimination. See, it's, it's all about speech. The 4,000 Hertz audiometric frequency is recognized as being both sensitive to noise and important for hearing and understanding speech in unfavorable or noisy listening conditions. Continuing on with NIOSH 1998, in recognition of the fact that listening conditions are not always ideal in everyday life and in concurrence with the ASHA, that's the American Speech Language Hearing Association Task Force proposal, NIOSH has modified its definition of material hearing impairment to include 4,000 Hertz when assessing the risk of occupational noise induced hearing loss. Therefore, with this modification, NIOS defines material hearing impairment as an average of the hearing threshold levels for both ears that exceeds 25 dB at 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, and 4,000. So now that's how you get 4,000 into the mix. Uh, and know that OSHA, the OSHA guidelines state uh, there's something called a standard threshold shift. This is something that's reportable. So if a worker has a standard threshold shift, then this needs to be re re reported uh, uh, re regarding their, their hearing conservation program. So if the average thresholds at 2,000, 3,000, and 4,000, well, now we're, now we're down to two, uh, three frequencies. See, it keeps shifting around different organizations. Show a worsening of 10 dB or more, the employee is considered to have a standard threshold shift. Most agencies use this criterion to determine if the worker has lost hearing ability since the baseline uh, pure tone threshold test. Okay, that's gonna be the end of this recording and then we'll go on to speech recognition and noise disorders.